Another thing, I don't promote future sermons a whole lot, but uh, as uh, Houston was talking about the uh, study on heaven, I believe it's an 11-week study, 11 or 12-week study. One of the things when he first started talking about that study that got my attention was just how good it, how good it would be f- for most of us to be focused on heaven for an extended period of time. Because when you live for heaven, it affects very positively how you live here. It changes how you live here. And um, so I, one of the things I feel best about this study, and in addition to the open group, I know some of our other small groups are picking up that same study. Others of you are in groups that are in the middle of something else. That's fine. You may have an opportunity later on to get involved in that study. But next Sunday, uh, I'm going to be talking some about heaven. So I want you to be here because I think one of my most, most uh, basic responsibilities as a pastor is to be sure you get there. <laughs> And to be sure you're wanting other people to get there. And, to, and, and that you are excited about getting there. And uh, so I, I hope, if at all possible, you can be here next week. And I'm um, looking forward. That's a, that's a really fun, fun thing to get to talk about. The AP um, news release ran a study of a survey a few months ago that had been taken asking Americans this question. What is the American dream? What is the American dream? The top answer they got was this, owning a home. The second main answer they got was this, not living paycheck to paycheck. paycheck. Third most popular answer was financial security. What is the American dream? Fourth most popular response, financial independence. And the fifth most popular response was to be able to take care of my family financially. Now, none of those are bad answers, but you may notice that when Americans are asked about their future and their dreams, they quantified their answers financially, even though the question had nothing to do with finances. The question was, was just, what do you, in your opinion, what is the American dream? Um, when I saw that, that survey, I was just reminded of a presidential campaign a few years ago where one of the main lines in the, in the, the campaign was... It's the economy, stupid, right? And I remember from the time I heard that, I thought, well, yeah, you know, the economy is important, but there are other things that are a lot more important, right? But when you see this kind of study that the top five answers given by Americans were all quantified in financial terms, it, it just tells you a little bit about what a huge role money and finances play in people's lives. And, and it is a huge role. Uh, we, we relate to money pretty much every day, don't we? That's just the world we live in. So it's really no wonder that Jesus had so much to say about money. Some of you have heard this before. To some of you, this may be new. But about 15% of everything we have recorded of Jesus' words related to money. About 15%. Uh, 16 of, I believe, 38 parables that we have recorded related to finances. Uh, When you go through like a word study in Scripture, the word faith, which we think is pretty basic to to Christianity, right? The word faith appears in Scripture 246 times. The word hope, 185 times. The word love, 735 times. The word give, or some version of that word, 2,285 times. Of course, giving really in many ways is a manifestation of faith and hope. And love, I mean, love in its essence is all about giving, isn't it? We read about John the Baptist who came preparing the way of the Lord. And uh, when people ask him about eternal life, he said you need to produce works that are consistent consistent with repentance. And when somebody said, well, what kind of works do you mean? He gave three examples. He said if you have two cloaks, then be willing to share with somebody else who doesn't have one. Or if you have plenty of food and somebody doesn't have food, then you share with them. Uh, tax collectors, don't collect more than you're supposed to collect. Uh, soldiers, he said, uh, don't extort money and be content with your pay. All, all three answers related to stuff, to finances. Jesus at the home of Zacchaeus, you remember when he went to that tax collector's home and pe- people were, you know, what in the world is he doing eating with a tax collector? And when he got to his house, Zacchaeus said, Lord, Half of everything I own, I'm giving away, and if I've che- given to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody, I'll pay them back four times over. And you remember what Jesus said? He says, today's salvation has come to this house. 
You know, it kind of gives you an indication of the role, just like the survey bears out, the, the role that, that material possessions and money can play in our house, now, and play in our lives. Now, obviously there are churches that have had a reputation for over-focusing on money. One of the reasons, you know, we made a decision when we started out that on Sunday mornings we wouldn't pass an, uh, an offering plate it's because we knew one of the big reasons people give for not going to church is they've gotten the idea that the church is only interested in their money and a lot of that idea has come from televangelists that they have seen as pushing to, to have a lot of money given. Uh, I remember a few years ago hearing about a couple whose two-year-old was playing and they, they saw him grab a quarter from the end table and stick it in his mouth and before his mom could get to him, he had swallowed it, and she just got hysterical. Call the doctor. Call the do-. Obviously, it was her first child, you know. Um, and so her husband picked up the phone and started dialing. She said, dial 911. Well, when, he, when he dialed more than three, three digits, she said, who are you calling? He said, I'm calling the pastor. She said, we don't need the pastor. We need a doctor. And he said, well, listen, our pastor could get money out of just about anybody. I think that he's the one... <laughs> And, you know, a lot of times churches to the world have gotten that reputation. However, again, when you, when you look at a poll where the top five answers to the American dream are all about finances, and when we see how much Scripture has to say about finances, then obviously our spiritual life has a very close connection to how we handle our finances, which can be scary, right? Um... God cares very much how we handle finances. Now, we've been, I've been talking over several weeks about really the impact we, we make with our lives and the legacy we leave, leave. And I didn't feel like I could really finish that up without talking a little bit about how we relate to the material world and how we relate to money. Um, just because that's a big part of the legacy. can be a big part of the legacy we leave with our life. You know, one of the things we decided early on at Harvest, because one of our main, our main callings is to connect people to church who have not been connected to church before. Uh, it's not the only reason we exist, but it's one of, the, one of our main, main goals, and many of you were not involved in church before you came to Harvest, and every time we have a membership class, we see that that continues to happen. We're excited about that. So in, as a part of that vision, we have tried to remove barriers that would keep people from, you know, it calls people to kind of shut down from listening before they even get started. And so that's why we decided on Sunday mornings not to pass an offering plate. I know often people have just said, you know, we, we, we want to learn how to handle our finances in a godly way. We also want to reach people that haven't been in church. And we want to hear when there are needs, when there are needs at harvest. And uh, I'll just tell you that, you know, we're, we're blessed with our finances at our church. Um, our giving is a little bit behind where it was last year, and we kind of, as leaders, have talked a little bit about that. We know a lot of people are paying a lot more all of a sudden on uh, health care, and that is, is one effect. But even though our giving is not where, quite where it was last year, and we'd like to catch that up, um, we've been blessed to have all we, we've needed for everything God's called us to do so far. We do feel like the Lord's calling us to some big things in the coming years like possibly launching some more Harvest Churches, and that's going to take some finances. Uh, but you pray about that, and we'll pray about that, and when we're faithful to God, He's faithful to us, right? And He provides everything we need for all He calls us to do. You know, a few things affect our lives like how we relate to finances and, and affect our legacy. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is speaking, and He says these words, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not 
rich toward God. Why does, why does God call this man a fool? Well, he, he, he begins by saying, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. I mean, he's foolish because he's greedy. You know, greed is an interesting thing. Very few people ever identify greed in themselves. It's one of those things that kind of is easily covered up by good things, you know? The tendency to save, you know? The tendency to uh, be conservative financially, maybe. I mean, it, it, they're, they're good things, but, you know, greed comes when we're rich materially, but we're not rich toward God. When we have a, a, an, a, an over... Uh, overly strong focus on accumulating things and when we trust in those things for for our security um, greed is fueled by fear by the fear that God either will not or cannot take care of us that's really the basis of it it's fear and God wants us free from fear you know this guy never really asked why do I have extra all of a sudden even though he's a farmer. And my experience is there are very few areas you can work in where it's, where it's more clear that you're dependent on God for your livelihood. Suddenly he has these, this huge harvest. And he doesn't really ask, what did God give me this for? His real problem, it says at the end, is he is not rich toward God. His focus on riches is on storing up stuff rather than on being rich toward God. And you know, most people in the world focus more on what they don't have than on what they do have. That's where part of the fear comes from. And when our focus is more on what we don't have than on what we do have, we can never really live with consistent joy or peace. We will not be thankful. When our focus is on what we don't have, God wants us to focus on what we do have and on His faithfulness. Also, when our focus is on what we don't have, we start mentally consuming what we'll get in the future before we even get it. Because our focus is on what we don't have and on either what we think we need or what we want, so we start consuming it before we even get it. Well, what are the different possibilities for, for why God may have allowed him to have more? Maybe it was so he could take care of his children. And taking care of your children is a good thing, although leaving a lot for your children is usually not a good thing. Right? I mean, studies show that over and over again, that usually when children get a large inheritance thing, or when they just get are given money, a lot of money, a large amount of money without working for it, they don't handle it very well, and usually things in their life don't go real well. Or maybe he had received a lot of extras so that he wouldn't have to worry about money. That's, that's the goal for many people, right? That I could, just, I could just make enough that I don't have to worry about money anymore. The ironic thing is, the more people make, the more they usually worry about money. Because they have more to worry about, right? Some of you have been to the Biltmore Mansion before, I know, in North Carolina. You know, that, the, that money all came out of the, the uh, fortune raised by W.H. Vanderbilt, who in the 1800s was worth over $200 million. Now, you compare that in the 1800s to what it would be now. Uh, I don't know if anybody in America has that kind of money, that many billions of dollars. But he once made this statement, the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. Usually, for most people, even though we think if I could just get enough not to worry about money, then I wouldn't worry about it. And, and if you can do that, that's a great blessing. But very few people do that. Don Jacob Astor, another of the super rich in the late 1800s, said, I am the most miserable man on earth. Peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Peace is rarely, peace is never just a result of a bigger bank account. Maybe the Lord gave him more money so he could elevate his standard of living. That's the American way. You know, the more we get, the more we elevate our standard of living. In fact, in America, we don't even have to wait till we get it to elevate our standard of living because we can borrow it, you know? We can get there ahead of the time. We, we can start the standard of living before we get to the income. And, uh, of course, if we do that, we create pressure on ourselves, don't we? It's an artificial pressure. 
If our lifestyle stays even with or surpasses our income, if, listen now, if our lifestyle stays even with or surpasses our income, which is the way most people in our country live, that's the way it's, you know, if we just follow everybody else, that's what we'll do. If we do that, we have no financial margin, and it becomes very, very difficult to keep our heart from falling into greed. There's got to be some margin. Can't constantly be maxing out our standard of living. Maybe the Lord gave him extra money so he could retire early. And I've seen some people who do great things retiring early. I, I know of a number of people who, instead of just going off to Florida to, you know, put the rest of their life away, uh, they've retired early and, and been freed to invest their life in the kingdom of God, in ministry. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Maybe, maybe that was why. But, you know, he, he never really stopped to ask the Lord, Lord, why? Why have you blessed me with this money? You know, the reality is, if as believers we never give until it impacts our lifestyle, then we find ourselves very open to the attack of greed. Have you ever had any kind of problem with money? You know, as much as people focus on money, we could, I, I could just name a list, it would take me a long time to get through, of, of the different problems people face concerning money. The problems are not dependent on how much we have or don't have. Whether money is a problem or whether it's a blessing has everything to do with how we relate to money and how we relate to God. The real problems with money come when we look for money to do something that only God can do. I read this little story a few years ago about a um, guy who... Walked into a bar, he looked real kind of, kind of mangy and rough, and he asked for a drink, and the bartender said, uh, I don't think you can pay for it. And the guy said, well, you're right, I don't have any money. But if I can show you something you've never seen before, will you give me the drink? The bartender was, was feeling generous and said, okay. Well, the guy reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a hamster and put it, put it down. He ran across the bar and jumped across to a piano, onto the keys, and began playing Gershwin. And the bartender says, you're right, I've never seen that before. He's, very, he's a very, very talented hamster. Well, the guy asked for another drink. He says, you're going to pay for it with cash or with a miracle, another miracle? And he said, well, uh, if I show you something else, will that be okay? Yeah. He reached in his pocket and pulled out a bullfrog, and the bullfrog began to sing in the most beautiful voice with just this rich, baritone voice, wonderful tone, wonderful pitch. And so a man came from another part of the bar and pulled out $300 and says, I'll give you $300 for the bullfrog. And the man said, you have a deal. He took it. The guy grabbed the frog and went out the door. And the bartender said, are you crazy? Don't you know that you could have made thousands of dollars with a, sing with a singing frog? And the guy said, oh, that's not so. You see, the hamster is a ventriloquist. Now, that story was longer than it's worth for the point, but I like the story. <laughs> and I just wanted to tell it. But, but there is a point, and that is this. We need to know what God alone can do in our lives. Because so many of our financial problems come when we look for money to do things that only God can do. See, we live in a world that constantly tells us to look to money for our security. You know, if we just have enough financially, we'll be secure. And yet, the Word says in 1 Timothy, don't put your trust in money. Tell those who are wealthy in this world, let me remind you by the world standards, that's all of us. Tell those who are wealthy in this world not to put their trust in money, which is so uncertain. So uncertain. But see, we, we're tempted to put our security in money. And if we do that, we'll never have enough to be at peace. We'll be at peace when we fully trust ourselves to God. We fully put ourselves in His hands, and when we receive His promises 
to care for all of our needs. Or we can be really tempted um, in this culture to look to our banking account for significance. You know, if, I can, if I can just make enough, then I'll be important. Well, as he said to this man, the man's life does not consist of the abundance of your possessions or for our, our identity or for our worth. You know, the reality is this. All of our resources, all, all of your resources, your time, your talents, your abilities, your possessions, and your finances, all of them are given to you with the highest goal being to use them for the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom. That's why He's given us those things. That's why when, when you find what you're really good at and you figure out a way to use it for the glory of God or to advance His kingdom, you experience a joy in what you're good at like you've never experienced before. Same thing happens when we're able to use our possessions for the glory of God and for His kingdom. And when we learn to use our time for the glory of God and for His kingdom, when we learn to use our finances for His glory. I, I shared a year or so ago about the little thing I was reading about World War II. I just was reminded about how, how much, like no time since then, has our nation all put, put all of its energy and focus on one cause. Now, not only did we have, like, I think 13 million people in uniform, but here at home, and that was when the U.S. population, I think, was like 145 million. Here, here at home, er everybody worked toward the war effort. Everybody was do were doing, the, uh, uh, there was rationing, there were drives to collect different materials that could be used for the war effort. People went into factories to, to produce uh, armaments or things that were needed for the war even when they weren't doing it for an income, they were doing it just, to, just for the war effort. The whole nation came together and all of the energy, because the world was at war and the stakes were so huge. You know, I think that's what God wants us to figure out, that in this life, we're here for a purpose that's so big and so, so important that not only affects the whole world, but affects all of eternity. And when we grasp that, then more and more we begin to pour all that we are and all that we have into what matters most. And when we do that, when we do that, the blessing is this. We begin to use temporary things for an eternal purpose. And when we use temporary things for an eternal purpose, those things are never lost. They endure eternally. Everything, everything that's not given to God will one day be lost. Nothing given to God will ever be lost. So that's what he's calling us to in making a difference in this life. We live in a world that's always chasing more, but people who chase more never have enough. That's just the nature of this world. William Randolph Hearst, the uh, great newspaper uh, billionaire built a huge home for himself that's called Hearst Castle some of you have been there before in California he filled it with Egyptian statues and Flemish tapestries and imported hand carved ceilings from all over the world the house is over 72,000 square feet situated on over 265 acres he collected stuff for 88 years and you know what he did then? He died. That was kind of short-sighted of him, wasn't it? And then he left his children to fight over his possessions. And now people can tour his house. And do you know what they say when they tour it? They say, wow, he had a lot of stuff. He left a lot of stuff. Yeah? Because that's what happens. When we want more, we never have enough. And we have to know that the nature of material things is in themselves they do not satisfy us. Solomon, maybe the wealthiest person who ever lived. You go through the book of Ecclesiastes, his, his search for meaning. And he begins by saying, I devoted myself to, and then he goes through the whole list, one after another, of all the things people devote themselves to to try to find meaning in life. 
devoted himself to parties, and we read that he had a daily food supply of 30 cattle, 100 sheep, 500 bushels of flour, deer, gazelles, poultry, every day. Devoted himself to beauty, built parks and gardens and vineyards, built himself a great palace. A crew of 150,000 construction workers that worked for 13 years. That's a nice house. Dedicated himself to music, an orchestra with all of the known instruments of that day, the finest singers. Accumulated over 1,000 wives and concubines. And he was supposed to be really smart. (laughs) He said this, All man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetites are never satisfied. He also said this, whoever loves money will never have money enough. Can't make us happy. Dr. Ronnie Bullman did an extended study where he used 22 big lottery winners, people whose lives had been significantly changed by winning a lottery. 22 people that he considered fairly average financially, and 27 people who had been paralyzed through accidents. And through this continued survey, discovered that over time, those who won the lottery were no happier than the average people and actually were able to extract less and less joy out of small things, while those who had experienced paralysis over time experienced more and more joy out of small things and and were more optimistic about future happiness than the lottery winners. Now see, really, at, at its root, our joy, our happiness is not all about our circumstances. But it's mostly about what's happening in us. And the only one who can fill us is the Spirit of God. So I just want to share a few of God's principles about finances that we have to know. One is this, God owns it all. God owns it all. If you haven't established that, that's the first thing. God owns all of the stuff that's your stuff, because it's really his stuff. You know? Just like with Randolph Hearst, when you go, you're not taking it. All right? You've heard. You've heard that statement before. You never see a hearse behind a, I mean, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse, right? You don't take it with you. It's his. Psalms 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. First Chronicles 29, when a great offering, David had raised a great offering for the temple, he says, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give this way? Everything comes from you. We've only given you what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow Without hope, Lord our God, all this abundance we've provided for building you a temple in your holy name comes from your hand. And all of it belongs to you. One of the most important things we can ever settle in this life is it all belongs to him. And if we know that and if we live that way, it'll change the way we live. And it'll result in great joy. Um, Bob McQuinn uh, tells a story of uh, that took place when his son was four years old. He uh, went to McDonald's, went through the drive-thru, and bought French fries. His, his son wanted French fries, and so he bought them. And, uh, you know, he, he kept grabbing the French fries, uh, his son's French fries. And his son said, stop it, Daddy. These are my French fries. You can't have any. And he said, I realized right away that there were several things he didn't understand. First, my son had forgotten that I was the source of all french fries. He would have no french fries without me. I brought him here. I bought the fries. I ordered them. All of the reason the fries were there were because of me. Secondly, he didn't know that I could take them from him at any time. Third, he also didn't know that if I wanted to, I could go back through the drive-thru and get a whole truckload of fries, more than he could ever eat. And fourth, that I didn't really need his fries because I had enough money to go buy my own. He said, I thought after that, God must look at us that way sometimes. You know, when we say, that's mine, you can't have it. I think the Lord must think, do you forget that I'm the source of all fries? <laughs> have you forgotten where it comes from and I don't really need it and I can produce as much to have it or I can, I can take it away from you whenever it needs to be taken away as well. It's all His. 
the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. And when we're generous, when we're generous, we become like God. He's abundantly generous. God's all about giving, isn't he? Lucato tells a story about a printer's daughter in the early days of printing. And according to the story, her father was in the midst of printing an edition of uh, Martin Luther's Bible. And she went in and, and the type had been set out for John 3.16, but only part of the verse. It just said, for God so loved the world that he gave. And this girl was just amazed by that part of a verse. She had always been afraid of God. And always feared him as a judge. And when she read those words, it touched her heart and it changed her. Changed her whole view of God, her whole relationship with God. And her mother noticed the change. And so she asked her, what, what's made the difference? And she told her about this part of the verse that she had read and how it had changed her whole view of God. And then the mom just said, well, God so loved the world that he gave what? And the child was perplexed for a minute, but then she said this, I don't know. But if he loved us well enough to give us anything, we should not be afraid of him. See, everything we have is because God is a giver. He showed us his love for us in this while we were still sinners. He gave his life for us. And so he calls us to give the first fruits back of what he gives to us. To give our first and to give our best. You know, that was a principle throughout Scripture on tithing was the first. You give the first. And I'll tell you, if you, if you determine that you're going to make an attempt to tithe and you haven't done it before, it'll only work if you give it first. I, I've, just, I've seen it over and over and over again where people make a decision to try to tithe and when they try to wait to the end of the month or the end of their pay period to see if the money's left over, it, it never is. But if you give it first, then you trust God to provide what you need. And, uh, and God is faithful uh, to give first and to give, and to give our first and to give our best. You know, Malachi chapter 3, pretty well-known verse where uh, the Lord says this, will a, mere, will, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. He says this, to the nation, you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. If there may be food in my house, test me in this. This is one place in the Bible where you have permission to test God. So if you've never done it before, you should do it. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. See, we can't, we can't really become generous until we just basically, first of all, give back to God. It'd be kind of like this. If, if you had a, a wealthy uncle who asked you to manage his finances and uh, was going to pay you, and so you thought it was a great deal and you were glad to get the job, well, then he comes to you and says, you know what, I don't really need that much money. You can keep nine-tenths of everything you make off my money. And you'd go, wow, what a great deal. You know, well, that really is what God does. God provides everything, and he says, I want you to remember where this came from. I want you to trust in the giver and not the gift. And so you give back. First, the first thing you do when you receive is you give back a tenth as a reminder. Not because I need it. I'm the source of all fries. But, you know, as we read in Deuteronomy, I, I tell you to tithe so that you will learn to always trust in the Lord. So he gives us nine-tenths, and he says, give back. And, of course, that's the beginning point of giving. We know that. I won't go into all that. Another thing we need to know this is that where our, our treasure is an indication of where our heart is. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want to kind of get an indication of where your heart is? Look at your, look at your expenses over the last month. You know, we, we don't really have trouble spending on things that we love, that really have our heart. The more we're captivated by Him, 
the more we take up his mission. And we want to use all our resources for his glory and for his kingdom. Our treasure indicates our heart. You know, there's a, a passage in uh, 2 Corinthians that says, God loves a cheerful giver. Um, do you enjoy giving? Uh, I mean, I know some people give because it's an obligation. But God wants us to enjoy giving. And do you, know, do you know how most people, if they struggle with having joy and giving, do you, know, do you know how they come to where they have joy? They give until they have joy. <laughs> it, it works the reverse, you know. You, you, a lot of things we want to sit around until God does something in us and then we'll respond. But so often when we respond to Him, then God does something in us. And when we determine to give and we continue to do that, then what happens is eventually we start trusting God. And we start seeing how He uses temporary things in our life for an eternal purpose. And we start sharing in the mission of God. And He brings us to a place where we can rejoice in giving like He does. It's a wonderful place to be. Wonderful thing not to have to fear giving away because, oh, I have to hang on. If I don't hang on... You know, how can I know if God's going to ever take care of what I need? Now, he wants us to know him and trust him. That he provides all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We need to know also that heaven is our home. This is not our home. Heaven is our home. And so that's where we invest in. Set your, set your mind on things above. Set your heart on things above. A lot of you know that a couple months ago, Ron and I went to visit our oldest son, Daniel, in Japan. When we were leaving Japan, we tried, we didn't make a huge effort at it, but we generally tried to spend as much of our Japanese money, as much of our yen as possible before we left to come back to the States, right? I mean, you do that whenever you're in a foreign country. Uh, but the, the money's not worth anything here, of course. Now, these days, you can get some return on it. Back here in the States, you could, you could exchange it here. You always get a real bad return once you get back to the States. In former days, you, you, there was not even a way to do that. Once you left the country, the money was worthless unless you went back. And so, you know, we went to a gift shop in the airport at Narita, and we were looking for T-shirts and things to buy because we didn't want to bring a lot of yen back. And, uh, you know, there, there will be a day where all of our currency will be useless. And not only our currency, but the gold and silver and the things that are precious here, they're, they're, they're not going to be worth anything. And so the Lord says that our money, how we use our money is in part a test. It's a test for how we, how we manage things God entrusts to us here. He says if, if, we, if we're able to, to manage temporary things well, then we're going to be entrusted with the real wealth. And so we have temporary things that can be used for eternal value. Heaven is our home. And so the word here, we, we just read a minute ago, says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, the statement I've heard before is, uh, you can't take it with, it with you, but you can send it on ahead. <laughs> store up treasures in heaven. First uh, Timothy, again, to those who are wealthy, it says, uh, lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Matthew 10, it says, if you even give a cup of cold water to one of these, my disciples, you're not going to lose your reward. Another thing is we, we need to understand that much of the freedom we experience in life comes as we give. You know, Jesus said in Acts 20, it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's very little joy in grasping anything. When we trust and have an open hand, we become vessels and God is free to pour life through us. That's a principle in every area of life. When we give, we receive. You know, uh, there's a great little visual illustration of that. A lot of people pointed it out over the years of just the geography of Israel. You remember the north is the Sea of Galilee, and in the Sea of Galilee, it's full, full of fish, full of sea life. It spills out to the Jordan River which goes down the uh, eastern side of Israel and into the Dead Sea, lowest place on earth. 
Water, is, it evaporates, it's hot, doesn't go anywhere. It just stops there, and there's nothing in it. It's filled with min- minerals, but it kills all the life. You know, when nothing comes out of us, we eventually stagnate. When we give, when we're open vessels, then God keeps pouring through us. We need to know that God prospers us so we can enjoy it. First Corinthians says he provides everything for our enjoyment and so we can give and share in his mission and in his purpose. You know, we have some people who are really good at gifted at making money, and that's a great thing. Um, it can be a real gift from God. In fact, Romans 12 listed it as a spiritual gift. Giving is a spiritual gift. And... Um, you know, but we understand he, he wants to use us as a vessel for his gift and for his provision and for advancing his kingdom. And then we need to always know this. It is God who is our provider. It's out of Philippians 4, 19, that promise. It says, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 9, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. That is, it's a strategic decision, by the way. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. See, one of the main things that we have in this life to make a difference for eternity are all the things that are connected to this material world. God wants us to invest them in things that will last forever. Our money, our time, our talents, our abilities. If we would understand God gives us these things, and we have the responsibility and the opportunity to use them in ways that will last forever. We'll do that when we trust him and when our heart is in his hands I want you to stand with me just bow your head for a moment the famous statement that just goes like this only one life will soon be passed only what's given to God will last And his invitation is this, that more and more of all we are and do and have will endure forever. Financial freedom comes when you know you can trust God to provide for all of your needs. Has he freed you from fear? Do you know that you can trust him? that when we're in his hands he will provide all we need that he really does work for good in all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose God wants you to know that he wants you to let go of the fear and receive the peace and joy from knowing the character of our God that he gives and provides abundantly that he is the source of of all, of all wealth and the source of all joy and peace and fullness of life. Have you offered yourself to him as a vessel to be used by him? Are you storing up in heaven? You know that's your home.
want to ask you, God knows your thoughts, you can just say it to him, but would you, would you just say to him, Lord, I want to give you all my resources, they're from you anyway. Lord, I just want to give them all to you. I want to give you, Lord, more and more. I want to, I'm, I'm telling you now, making a decision in my heart, you're going to have to teach me practically how to do it, but Lord, my time on this earth is a gift from you. I give it back to you. Lord, show me how to use my time in a way that will matter for all eternity. Show me how to use it in a way that will bring glory to you and advance your kingdom. Lord, my time is yours. Lord, my talents are yours. You gave them to me. My abilities are yours. So I'm just giving them back to you. You're going to have to show me how to use them in a way that brings glory to you. And it makes a difference for eternity. But Lord, my talent belongs and my abilities belong to you. Lord, my possessions are not mine. The earth is the Lord's and all that's in it. Lord, I just want to acknowledge again that my possessions belong to you. Thank you for letting me use them for the uh, enjoyment that we get out of using those things. But Lord, they're yours. Show me how to use them for your glory. Lord, my money, my finances, you're the one who gives people the ability to make money. And Lord, today I just want to recognize again that my finances are yours. Show me how to manage your money in a way that brings honor and glory to you and advances your kingdom. Or that when we stand before you, these things that you've entrusted to us will not be something that's just lost. Lord, they will have eternal value because we place them in your hands. Lord, I just ask that as we yield our lives to you, we just now receive the peace of God that passes understanding to rule our hearts and mind. The peace that comes from knowing we have a loving Father who keeps all of his promises and has all the power in the universe to bring him about. Lord, we just receive the joy of the Lord, the joy that comes in your presence, the joy from knowing that in the coming days as we walk with you, we're going to make a difference for all eternity on this earth in the lives of people around us. Lord, we just receive your unfailing, perfect love. And Lord, as we yield ourselves to you, we would live for the praise of your glory. And that here, now, we will know life in all its fullness. Thank you for the blessing of knowing you. The altar here is open. If you want to come pray, or there's some things you just want to yield to God, maybe there's a real struggle in your, in your heart, you know you really want to trust God, but it's a, it's a battle for you to do that. You want to, you want to be joyful in giving. You, you want to trust God. Our altar team, they're going to come. They'll be here. They'd love to pray with you. If God's speaking to you, you feel free. You feel free to stay and, uh, and pray or let someone pray for you. Lord, as we go from this place, we go with you. We just thank you. You know the plans you have for us this week. Keep teaching us. Keep using us. Walk with us. And Lord, we just thank you for what you have in store as we continue this journey with you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.